want to talk about what's the vision of what we don't want to lose. This is uh, a construct that comes from Howard Gardner, who's a professor at Harvard, who wrote the book called Multiple Intelligences, which you might know. So he has a framing of what he calls good work. And he says good work has three attributes. It's good in quality. It has academic rigor, accuracy, craftsmanship, beauty. And the good work might be the academic work you're doing, or it might be, for example, the carpentry that the Wilson's son Henry is doing right now, which is as good an example of craftsmanship as you'll find anywhere. But it's that your work is well done. That pride in doing good work. It's the work that the Hayes family does in their shop. It's the work that everybody in town takes pride in. What I do, I do well. That's a key. The second is that the work you're doing is good for the soul, that you're doing work that's fulfilling, that you want your kids you want your kids to be going into something in their life that's fulfilling for them, and you yourself want to do work that's fulfilling. And lastly, work should be good for the world in some way. In some way, the work you're doing, you should feel like it's contributing to the world. Whether that's getting people's cars running again, getting their houses built, getting work houses uh, landed for them, doing something to make the world somewhat better. So the question that Mark and I can ask ourselves in our work is, are we allowing kids the opportunity to practice doing good work before they go out to the world? Because you can't have kids do no good work for 13 years, 16, 17 years of their life, then send them out in the world and expect that that's their priority. So what we're saying is kids need an opportunity to do good work, meaning high quality, good for the soul and good for the world long before they leave school. So that when they leave school, they have a mission. That, that what I'm learning is for a purpose. It's to do good work in the world. So I want to show some examples of good work. I'm going to start with way back, not my classroom, Ken Lindsay's classroom, third and fourth grade students. Some of you will remember this. When the state of Massachusetts wanted to do an amphibian census, what amphibians live in every town? Many towns used a herpetologist or a naturalist to go out to the community and do a census of what amphibians live. We used third and fourth graders. <laughs> and it wasn't just because Shutesbury is cheap. And we don't have herpetologists. It's, to be honest, would you rather have one naturalist driving up here from a nature center who doesn't know the woods of Shutesbury, or would you rather have 31 third and fourth graders who know the woods really well? and who can't wait to get out there and get into the woods and the streams to look for stuff. All it took was making sure that these third and fourth graders were experts in identifying, not only identifying, it's your son. Thank you. Oh, it's Sam. Um, <laughs> not only identifying adults, amphibians, which is fairly easy if you get good at it, but identifying larval amphibians, which is not easy at all, even for adults. These kids became experts. And they collected every kind of amphibian one could find in the town of Shutesbury. And they did it during school, and they did it after school, and they did it on weekends, and they became obsessed with collecting amphibians. <laughs> Now, when they sent their data to the state of Massachusetts, they got a nice response that this town of Shutesbury submitted more data than any town in the state. It, you know, we did have 31 herpetologists instead of one, but we had a more comprehensive census of amphibians than anywhere in the state. But the state also said that we had made some mistakes because there were a couple amphibians we identified that aren't actually found in our to which the kids replied respectfully, we think we're right. Here are some photos and our data on the things we found. To which the state replied, can we come out and meet with you next week? <laughs> and of course the kids were right and the state was wrong. And they brought them out into the woods and showed them where they collected these things and the kids realized we're not practicing at being scientists, we are actually being scientists, even as third and fourth graders. And we're doing some good for the world. They also got involved, along with me and other, Ken and other folks, in a project to protect this guy, the spotted salamander, by helping to build the world's first salamander tunnels, which are a mile from my house. They're actually in Amherst. 
Sorry to bring up the word here. Uh, uh, but kids were involved in the digging and in the building of drift fences, and certainly kids, this was a Shootsbury third grader who designed that road sign, uh, which used to be a mile from my house next to Cushman Center. It's on Henry Street, except that college students have taken off every single one of these that's ever been installed. So now you see, you don't see that sign there anymore because they all ended up in dorm rooms. But another example of kids contributing good work. Those kids then worked to create a field guide for the amphibians of Shootsbury. This was done by a third grade boy, Caleb Peely. And that field guide happened to be more accurate than any state field guide because they actually knew what animals lived in Shootsbury. So we took that field guide. I took that field guide around the country to schools that EL works with, and it became the model for other schools. So we brought that field guide to Portland, Maine, where there is a middle school that has 500 students, 140 of whom were not born in the United States. They're, they speak 30 different languages in the school, and a third of the students are refugees. And that school decided, if Shootsbury can make a field guide, we can do one too. And so all the students, whether they were born in Portland or born in Sudan or Somalia, like many of their students, worked together to create a field guide to Casco Bay, which is in Portland, Maine. And unlike Shootsbury, Casco Bay gets a lot of tourists because people come from all over the country to visit Portland. And when you go to Portland, the field guide you're going to see is a field guide created by seventh graders. Whether they were Portland-born kids or African-born kids, they all studied these animals, became experts in them, and created field guide entries to the animals of Casco Bay. And that field guide was not only sold in touristy shops, but it was sold by the National Park Service to raise money to keep Portland Bay clean. Additionally, those kids did water testing in Portland Bay and gave their data to the city and to the state. Now, one of the beautiful things about working for an organization that's part of Outward Bound, the Wilderness Organization, is that this school did not allow these kids to go online and find a picture of a jellyfish and draw it and copy it. They had to draw these things from life, which meant that they went down to Casco Bay and put on wetsuits and went in the water with digital cameras and took pictures of this stuff. And anything they couldn't find in real life, they had to go to an aquarium and photograph. Because scientists don't draw pictures from internet. Scientists <laughs> study real stuff. The other thing I would say is that when you want to take kids born in Portland and kids born in Sudan and get them to actually sit together in the cafeteria versus sort of staring at each other across the way, you don't just tell them to treat each other nice. You make them put on wetsuits, freeze their butts off, scream and yell underwater, think their teachers are crazy, work together, support each other, and cry and laugh, and at the end of the day, hug each other and feel like, we have some crazy teachers, but we're pretty heroic here. <laughs> Which is why for the second day of school for 25 years, I took students, and many of you helped me with this, cave exploring on the second day of school. Because we got filthy, we were scared to death, we worked together, we supported each other, and at the end of it, people felt like a team. And part of this is building teamwork and character. Part of it's building citizens and people, not just building academic skills. Well, we didn't just bring that field guide to Portland, Maine. We also brought it to an inner city school in Springfield, where kids cleaned up and created a field guide to the bog behind their middle school, Duggan Middle School, right in the middle of Springfield. To turn that, this, at the time we came into the school, it was the lowest performing school in the state. We still have a long way to go with that school, but their English language arts skills went from a 2% proficient to equal to city proficiency over the course of four years. It wasn't just this project, but this project showed them that they could be proud of their work. It took a lot of hard work as well. We also brought that field guide to, oh, this is a page from that field guide. We also brought that field guide to a kindergarten in Washington, D.C., and those kindergarten students did a field guide to the trees in the park right down the street from their uh, kindergarten class. And they worked with a local arborist to make sure that all of their information was accurate. They did the drawings for this. So that field guide went all around the country. We now have about 50 field guides inspired by this Shootsbury project. Local field guides that didn't exist before made by second graders, made by third graders, 
made by seventh graders. And we even brought that field guide to a high school in San Diego. And they called us up a year later and said, do you want to see our finished field guide? And it turned out to be a $25 book with a forward by Jane Goodall <laughs> <laughs> that had a print run of 10,000 copies. And it's the definitive field guide to San Diego Bay. And when you go to San Diego Bay, if you want a book, you will, uh, a field guide to San Diego Bay, you're going to be buying a book written by high school students, researched by high school students, who worked with scientists who did all the research, all the writing, all the photography, all the layout, all the book production. And this is now the first of six field guides that that high school has produced that are for commercial use. And when people say, where do they get the money to do this? The, the better question is, what do they do with all the profits when they sell 10,000 copies of a $25 book? Their latest field guide has a forward by E.O. Wilson, for those of you who know who is. They have had quite an impact because there is, when you think about it, there's nothing that adults can do that high school students couldn't really do when they put their heart and mind to it. They are just as capable as adults. It's just that we don't give them that chance to be adults in their work and give them that responsibility. Once again, these are not rich suburban white kids. These are inner city San Diego kids.